Peace. Shalom. Back in with chapter 24 of the road from Orion. Please screenshot so that you can uh, read along. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Help me out. Thank you so much. The palm at the end of the mine, beyond the last thought, rises in the bronze decor. A gold-feathered bird sings in the palm without human meaning, without human feeling, a foreign song of mere being, Mr. Wallace Stevens. From the information Lucia just gave us, it was clear that at death, a person would finally see his double, and if the deceased was on the right path, he would not annihilate with his double. The wrong path resulted in annihilation, or what I call death by double, and possibly a return to an earthly existence as a rodent, a dog, a turkey, or a human who could not remember anything about his previous life or afterlife experiences. It was essential that John and I travel the correct path, which was the west, then north along the curvature of the globe to the North Pole. Here we would ascend the Egyptian great stairway and see the sun god and his anxious crew ready to ferry us into the transformation furnace of hell, also known as E. coli, a one-cell rod-shaped gram-negative bacterium with a double membrane and a polar lamb receptor site with six gates or interconnected rooms. I exhaled deeply for I was having difficulty seeing myself as an information molecule bonded to a virus for a trip through a cell. Still, I tried to visualize the trip as a logical series of events so I would not go crazy. Once inside the dark cell, I imagined we would flow down electrical potential gradients like an electrolytic message floating along the long chromosome which connects to metabolic pathways. Proteins would be everywhere, enzymes for catalysts of cellular reactions, communication proteins such as hormones, receptors, and chemical messages, transport proteins with tunnel-like channels, structural proteins, and finally, our greatest adversary would be cells, defensive proteins, antibodies, and other molecules that bind to foreign molecules and destroy them. For we were foreigners invading like Alexander the Great. We planned to take over the cells replication machinery, machinery so that we could be replicated and packaged into millions of human viral particles with heads and tails that would emerge from the Trojan horse of the cell like a miniature warrior, like a plague of locusts with human faces, iron breastplates, and scorpion tails. Stop! I told myself, stop! The flight of ideas. No matter how I thought of this transformation, it was unappealing, and I could not imagine a human with viral parts. Again, images flashed through my mind, tormented me, until I finally stalled on an unsettling picture of John as my Siamese twin, and our lukewarm head was locked together into a distorted geometric solid that looked something like the stretched triangulated cube of pentagons that disturbed doors melancholy angel was there no other option maybe rebirth was a possibility but then who could guarantee how one's molecules would be recreated ultimately i thought the sun will win by overcoming the earth 
for it forever rams and hammers our tiny planet with speeding gusts of solar plasma. And if this doesn't demolish our globe, we may explode our own planet with nuclear warheads and octane nitrocubane. Blasting our molecules into the heavens and then what? Will one's conscious remains just drift in outer space like a piece of immortal debris? Maybe now was the time to transform into an adaptive species by jumping to a viral genome that could retain human consciousness while replicating into a life form similar to the cold light matter that already populates most of the universe. Still, the idea of a cross between hot and cold species, a lukewarm species, and a bioluminescent phage head was not my vision of eternity. For the human experience, although a miscalculation with the wrong numbers, is magnificent. At times, the glory of the human world is overwhelmingly beautiful. Then, it can also be catastrophic, a terrible sorrow, a painful nightmare drowned in despair. Yet, I could not ignore the fact that the Egyptians believed their pathway led to satisfactory eternity and a chance for human beings to exist as a constructive life form. Perhaps the Tahamara tribe believed in this same destiny. I tried to console myself with the idea that the afterlife might look like a lot better when we arrived there. But then it could also be a lot worse. Reminding myself to be positive and use imagination, I surmised that if the dead knew the Egyptian path to eternity, they would not have to endure the inevitable judgment scene ordained by our religions. A bad experience where you were like one of Coleridge Mariners or Prince Prospero's guests, not really sure where you would end up, what you did wrong, or why you were invited. Thoughts like these persuaded me that the Egyptian afterlife transformation was actually a form of secret salvation because knowledge of the path was only given to the pharaohs and nobilities, not the plebs. The plebs. If it dawned on me that the plebs were never really able to figure out the exact pathway, so the idea of heaven and hell filtered down through the centuries in religious propaganda from church officials to enforce a morality on the common people that made them easier to control. Faith, the theologians cried. You must accept the doctrines on faith. Of course, the church officials had to accept their own doctrine on faith because they didn't know what it meant either. They did not know the pathway to eternity for the directions were buried in Egyptian hieroglyphs that were not deciphered until John Francosis Champollion broke the code in 1822 even this discovery did not unveil the hidden meaning in the phonetic symbols and artwork that Lucia claimed she decoded. Nonetheless, this endeavor by the pharaohs and nobility to keep their scientific knowledge secret was abetted by their ability to keep the bloodiness pure of intermarriage within the rule line. That was not bloodiness, that was bloodline, sorry. Yes, incest was the means to keep the plebes out of the royal affairs that related to a secret scientific knowledge that would give the kings an edge in the afterlife. But incest may also inc ha have increased the Egyptians' predisposition for mind expansion into the tiny quantum world. In fact, brother, sister, and child-parent marriages were common in pre-modern cultures and believe royal incest nurtured supernatural abilities. Naturally, common folk, folk were not allowed this special privilege, but the kings were. Add this inherited inclination of the kings to white powder use, and one might experience a passage into the quantum world similar to what 20th century psychologists have called schizophrenia. Instead of concealing authentic 
experiences modern psychologists could have trapped into innate wind wisdom like the ancients tapped into innate wisdom like the ancients rather but again and again psychologists have shown that they do not have the skills necessary to mentor schizophrenics for they have resorted to electroshock treatments isolation, straitjackets, incarceration, sedatives, and other drugs. They have purposely masked quantum insight in a shroud of insanity. In the midst of my reveries, John had fallen asleep in his chair. I thought I saw a shadow behind him, a rippling movement beyond the rock ledge, but it must have been the silhouette of a hawk angling the air current beneath the sun. It wasn't long before Lucia returned with black coffee, no extras.